word and wisdom of God. We open our hearts to the word and wisdom of God. The first scripture is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, from on page 922 in the Bible. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say everyone among you, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministry, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate and cheerfulness. Thank you. And our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. And this is where Jesus uh, pays a visit uh, to the temple and decides to start making a real mess of things. And um, I, I always like that. And I'm, I, I know I've done this before. <coughs> But I have a little poster in my office, and it, it does say, if anyone ever asked you, what would Jesus do? Remind, remind her that um, flipping over tables and chasing people with whips is an option. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we opened up confirmation last year. <laughs> Should challenge us. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. <coughs> His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, and thanks, thanks be to God. God. Please pray with me. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, this could be a limited character reference, and I've been accused of making pop cultural references um, at random points, but I'm going to go ahead and try this. How many of you are familiar with the cartoon show Futurama? That's a fair enough number. Um, so I'll go ahead. Literally. Um, in Futurama, they have this, this, it's a cartoon series that's made by the same creators as The Simpsons. And they've decided it's really important that at times we have historical figures able to speak into the narrative of the show. And so in order to bring these historical figures out, they realized that they had invented a way to preserve their heads. And so throughout the show, riddled at various different places, will be talking heads. Literally, they're sitting in a pickle jar, or something like a pickle jar, with a little of scientific looking device underneath it, and they're able to talk. The President of the United States in the future is apparently none other than Richard M. Nixon's head. 
and he goes around carried around by Spyro Agnew's body. And so wherever it is, you get this disembodied head talking and commanding the entire United States, or the world, actually, I think at this point. So he's president of the world, um, and it's just a head. And you begin to realize that as looking into this cartoon, we're just looking at people's heads. And I find that amazing. It's funny at the show, but I start thinking about, why are we talking about just the head? Why is that the only thing that the creators of the show think is important about the people? So we're only focused in on this line. And I think the reason that we think that is because in our way of thinking, in our Western world going on from antiquity and forward, has focused in on our minds as being the most important parts of our body. Plato suggests that the intellect exists in order for us to con contemplate the things that never come, the things that are the things that are, and the things that never come into being. And so you think about the forms of perfection. <coughs> Your mind exists to think about whatever it is in the world and contemplate on it. And then the mind also thinks, he says, about that which doesn't exist yet but is coming into being, that which is different. And so we look at our lives as this idea where our minds are thinking about that which is the same and that which is different. He then suggests that every other function of the body, our hunger, our sex drive, our whoever we are, is a lesser thing. It's not as important. And it's whatever, and it gets in the way of operating the mind, but because we need a body in order to be a vessel for the mind, we have to have those things. And so he suggests that part of what we have to do is discipline our minds such that we minimize the distraction that those base urges, those animal urges require, and we just focus in on the mind. He was so convinced by this that he even suggested the whole reason that human beings walk upright the way we do is because our minds are rooted into the divine which is above us. And so our rootedness is actually is what puts us in this upright position. Now you think about that today, and we go, hmm, and how many of us are really focused in on just our minds, the power of thought, the idea that what we spend most of our time doing is in service to whatever it is we're thinking about and things. If ever if you've written an email, you realize that you spend so much of that time on the email thinking about it. And the interaction physically with the email is almost minimal. Because it's just your fingers dancing across a keyboard. Or text messaging. Think of a text message on your phone. You think about it. Your thumb waves across your phone very rapidly, tapping out whatever it might be that you're saying. And if you're really good, you can do it with two hands. But you lose something in that communication. You lose the body image. You lose what's going on. If you were to just hear what I'm preaching right now, you wouldn't see that I'm the type of person who moves my hands about so much, and I only do that to keep everybody awake, that's all. <laughs> There's no other reason. But the idea is that the body is just a vessel for the mind. That's all it's trying to do. And Descartes posited this equipped later on in the 17th century, I think, therefore, I am. And so once again, everything came about just thinking, that we are thinking things, that our whole purpose in life is to think about the world and come up with ways to make our mind direct our bodies to do whatever it is that we want them to do, and therefore minimize everything else. But what do you think happens when we start preferencing the mind over the body and the rest of the body? What do you think we start to say about our bodies implicitly and maybe not even thinking about it? I think at that point what we start to think is that our bodies are lesser than the mind. And we start to look at our bodies as things that, as, as stumbling blocks that stand in the way of whatever it is that we can imagine, whatever it is that we can dream, all of those things. We look at our bodies and we start to disrespect them because they age, because they get ill, <coughs> because they don't do whatever it is that we want them to do. They get weak. And so we say, my body, my body's terrible. 
And we start doing this practice of body shaming, and we think that we're too fat, or slow, or bumpy, or hairy, or not pretty enough, or not handsome enough, or not tall enough, or not short enough. Our bodies get frail, and they get old, and they fall ill, and they keep us from getting where we really want to go. They don't fit in the plane seats anymore. They make weird noises. They emit things that we don't want them to emit. And that plane seat thing, guys, that's actually the fault of the airlines, I'm convinced. They make seats that don't even lean back anymore. Spirit. Yes, I'm flying on that tomorrow. And so we realize all of these things about our bodies, and we just go, check, 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 I don't like my body. Has that ever thought ever occurred to you? That you don't like your body? No? Everybody's being really shy. <laughs> it's occurred to me many, many times that it's not adequate, it's not fit for purpose, it's not as good as that person's. And that's what we're often taught. And when we hear those stories from St. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 13, where he says, your body is a temple. What is the first thing you think when you see that? It's like, oh dear, not that again. Because it's been used as a club over people. It's just like, you should be better. You should be this. You should be that. You shouldn't be doing this with your body. You shouldn't be doing that. And it's used as a club for body shaming. <laughs> it's true. We think... We tend to forget that our bodies actually are what they are. That our bodies shape very much who we are. And our bodies are very much a part of, of what we are. We tend to think when we hear those things about our bodies being temples, we tend to forget that it doesn't matter what your ideal of a temple <coughs> is. Your body, right now, as it is, is a temple. The body that you have right now, sitting in this room, slightly uncomfortable in the pew, shifting about, having an itch right inside your right knee, that body is a temple. And Jesus talks about these, his body as being a temple in that Gospel of St. Mark because the body is what matters more than the building. Because it is the body that is the one that is going to go out and do ministry. This part of John, you notice that it's chapter 2. Jesus has barely begun his ministry in John's Gospel. And yet it is that temple that he is going to take throughout all of this Holy Land that is going to do the work of God. Not the brick and mortar building but the body. And as he goes out to place, to place, to place, what does he spend most of his time doing? Healing. Healing bodies. Healing people. Because what that body does, what that temple does that is moving throughout the world, is that temple is what expresses love, that temple is what expresses fear. That temple is what expresses joy. It's that temple <coughs> that sings. Not the building. Not the place. But the body. <coughs> this church building cannot clap. This church can clap. This church can sing. This church can garden. This church can do a protest march. This church can go out and feed the hungry. This building cannot. Your body matters. Now, does it get old? Does it get weak? Yes, it does. Does it share its stories from that position? Does it share those experiences and have empathy that's developed because it knows what it's like to be ill? Oh yes. Does a person with HIV share the gifts of what it's like to live with HIV with other people because of the empathy that he or she has developed over time? Oh yes. But what happens when we devalue our bodies? 
What happens when we treat them as less than the mind? Because, folks, your mind and your body are linked together. Your mind and your body are one. The body of Christ has many parts, each one with its unique gifts. Your body has many parts, wave your hand, but each one has a different gift. On Friday of this past week, a banner was vandalized at St. Philip's Episcopal Church, just down the road on Bestgate Road. The banner was put up on Wednesday, and it was after a year and a half of discussion and debate that St. Philip's became one of three churches in Annapolis to put up a Black Lives Matter banner. The Unitarian Church had done it, the Quakers had done it, and they invited St. Philip's to join them. And the difference between the Unitarians and St. Philip's and the Quakers is that St. Philip's is on a major road. They're visible. And their banner was placed right there so that the whole world could see it. And within two days, somebody came with a can of white spray paint, sprayed out the word black, and rewrote the word all. Now, I didn't watch the Democratic debates, but I know that the question came up. What is the difference between all lives and black lives? Or maybe it was something like that. Like I said, it was handed to me. And St. Paul writes all the time about things being handed to him, so I can, I'll go off with that same kind of authority. <laughs> all lives and black lives. Before I start that, remember that what our life is, it is a unity of our body and our mind, shaped by the experiences and the relationships that we form one with another. And that shapes us not just mentally, but physically as well. And how we react to one another is shaped by the relationships that we ourselves have formed over time. How we react to difference will be conditioned by our experiences and by our education and by our discipline one with another. So I look at that all lives matter and I say, of course all lives matter. Of course. Of course I want to say that. And when the first protest began after Ferguson and the Black Lives Matter phrase began going, getting bandied about, I went, well, all lives matter, don't they? Why are we saying just black lives? That was my first thought. And then somebody pointed out to me why that phrase was important. Why that phrase mattered. And they said, look at the world around you. You can't say all lives matter if they really don't. Look at the systemic injustices around you. Look at the opportunities and the lack of opportunities. Why is it that your poorest neighborhoods, the ones that the police are most visible and present in, are African American? Why is it that when we're planning a new uh, garbage incinerator in Baltimore, it's being placed in an African American neighborhood? Why is that And so I began to realize, all lives cannot matter unless and until black lives matter. And that whole concept behind that stretches far beyond just one race. It stretches, too, to poor people. It stretches, too, to women. It stretches to transgender people, to LGBT people, to people of all sizes, shapes, and races. Because what it suggests to me is that when we think about bodies that are different from ours or different from the ideal that we picture in our head, that body is less important than that ideal. And we are stuck with a massive challenge that Jesus himself throws to us when he talks about bodies being temples, when Paul talks about bodies and being temples, to be able to look at every single human life and recognize that that life is a temple of God, whether or not we like it or not. And that's the challenge.
That's the difficult thing, is when we recognize that we have to focus in on those who have been left out of the economic system, those who have been left outside of what is considered normal and proper and appropriate. We have to focus on those lives. When I first came to this church, I joked about us being the United Church of Christ of Annapolis, not in Annapolis. And I said, that's actually a fantastic place to be. Because Jesus did his ministry on the edgelands. He was on the border of where it was until just as he went in to make his, his statements at the end of the Gospels. And perhaps that's what it means to be the church, to be what we are. Our physical location is the same as perhaps where our bodies, our temples that we bring into this place week after week and in between as well, that we bring out into the world and we give to the world through our service, through our knowledge, through our love. It's right on the edgelands, the outskirts of what is considered normal and appropriate and standard. And because we're outside of it, we're able to critique it and see it and say, you know what? These marginalized lives matter. And they matter because for God, our physical bodies matter. Why is the resurrection a body? Because the body matters. It's because you matter. It's because those aches and pains that you might be having right now matter. All of that matters. That cough matters. All of that is part of who we are. And that's amazing. And yet also we are like that garden just out there. We get planted. We get rooted. We get placed together in that earthy soil that is our faith, that nurtures and nourishes us, and we grow together, intertwining those roots, intertwining those leaves, and becoming a place that grows strong, not as one single plant, but as all our children developed with their hands crossed together, linked together in that ecosystem that is faith. Our temples do not stand alone. They are part of a network. They are part of a body. And whatever it is that we are called to be as the body of Christ, it's going to be together. And it's going to be able to feel the pain and the loss and the loneliness and the joy and the excitement and the love together, not just young, not just old, not just in between, but as each and every temple that I see, looking back at me with those amazing eyes that all of you have, and saying, Amen, let's do this together.